Welcome to this week's worship service at St. Paul's United Methodist Church in Nitro, West Virginia. My name is Greg Markins. I'm the pastor here, and I'm so glad you chose to worship with us today. As a way to let us know that you're here worshiping with us, I invite you to like our page or comment in the feed below. Now, let us worship together. How are you this morning? I'm doing good. Um, I'm enjoying the nice weather that we're having, at least a break in it um, so far this part of this week. Um, you know, I was wondering, had a question. Do you have a favorite Bible verse that you've heard or that you've memorized? Well, you know, one of my favorites is one that we've talked about a lot in different parts of it. And it starts off, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Do you remember that one? That's right. It's John 3, 16. Well, I was thinking about that verse and wondering just how great is the amount of love that God has for each of us. And how can we actually measure that amount of love? Well, you know, a couple of things that we use um, on a day-to-day -day basis, if you cook, um, you know, if you've ever helped someone in the kitchen make uh, a cake or some cookies, you've used a measuring cup. And with that measuring cup, you know exactly the right amount of flour or sugar, the combination of that, that will make whatever you're making taste really, really good. Well, in the book of Psalm, um, chapter 23, it says that the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And then it goes on to say, my cup runneth over. And you know, if a cup runneth over, that measuring cup probably isn't nearly big enough to measure um, the amount of love that God ha does have for us. And then there's another thing that we use to measure. Now, you've probably seen this in someone's garage. It's a measuring tape. Oh, I've got it upside down. Measuring tape. See, it's got the graduated uh, markings for the different inches and tenths of an inch and, and the different fractions. Um, you have to measure things to see if, to make sure that things will fit. You know, if you're building a deck out back, you've got to make sure that all the boards are the same length that would be on that same side. Well, 
what does the Bible say about you know, measuring God's love? Well, in the book of Psalms again, in chapter 108, it tells us that God's love is higher than the heavens. Well, this measuring tape that I have here, it only goes out to six feet. So I'm guessing that the heavens, which will be way beyond the clouds, we would never be able to have a measuring tape that will go long enough to measure all the way to heaven. Well, another thing that we measure things by, measure time, we do that with our watches. Now, I'll guarantee you that every adult that's listening to this children's message at one time or another during a pastor sermon, whether it be Pastor Greg's or any of the other ministers that we've had at St. Paul's, they've looked at their watch about halfway through the sermon and says, good grief, how much longer is this going to go on? And they watch their clock to tell time. Well, you know, in the book of Psalms, chapter 103, again, and you know, I made a mistake. The first one was chapter 108. This is chapter 103. It says that God's love is from everlasting to everlasting. Well, you know, our watches will continually run, but they go from the hours of 1 to the hours of 12. There's not an unending num amount of numbers. So even our watch can't measure, you know, how much time and how long everlasting is. So for the rest of the verse for John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believed in him wouldn't perish, but they would have everlasting life. So how do you really measure a love like that? Well, we can't measure it. We don't need to. Um, but what we do need to do is to experience it and to tell others how much love God has for him and for you and for everyone in the world. So my hope is that you understand how wide and long and high and deep his love really is for each and every one of us. And in the book of Ephesians in the Bible, it says that God's love is so great that you will never fully understand it. So, you can't measure it, but you know that it's there. Let's have our closing prayer. Good morning, Lord. Thank you for your love. A love so great that you gave your one and only Son so that we could have eternal life. A love that we should always remember to tell others about every chance we get. Amen. You have a good week, and I'll see you again next Sunday. Bye. Let us join our hearts together in prayer. Loving God, whose touch can heal the broken places of life, touch us today. God of peace, whose spirit of peace can quiet our spirits of confusion and despair, reassure us today. Forgiving God, whose call to repentance promises grace upon grace, place your mercy in our souls today. You who heal the sick and liberate the imprisoned, who bring justice in the midst of oppression and strength in the midst of weakness. Pour out your spirit of power upon us today. Open our hearts to new faithfulness. Redirect our waywardness and hold us gently in your goodness. We confess our need to you and we turn to you with hearts filled with hope, remembering the promises you have made to us. May your name be glorified in us and through us. We ask it through Christ Jesus, your only begotten Son, He who is our Lord and our Savior, our brother and our friend. Lord, we place our trust wholly in you, now and forever our Lord, in whose name we pray as he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Good morning, everyone. Our scripture lesson today is from Isaiah chapter 40, verses 21 through 31. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, and its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heaven like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown, no sooner do they take root in the ground than he blows on them and they wither and a whirlwind sweeps them away like chaff. To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One. Lift your eyes and look to the heavens who created all these. He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls them each by name. Because of this great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and complain, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord. My cause is disregarded by my God. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. 
This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This past week, Teresa and I lost four colleagues in ministry. And one of those colleagues was a beloved pastor of this church, my predecessor, Mark, who was here for 10 years. The sense of loss here and, and throughout the United Methodist Connection in the West Virginia Annual Conference has, has been tremendous. It has indeed been a, been a very heavy week. And yet the reality is, while this past week has, has been a difficult one, it has been a hard year for everyone, including our clergy. Last week, a clergy colleague shared a heartfelt note on his Facebook page. This is what his post says. I've just taken down a post on my page that seemed too political for some. Please accept my apologies. But may I say, while we are on the subject, it's a hard time to be a pastor. My concern is for my congregation. I'm hoping that we can come through this pandemic and through this divisive season in our nation's history with as little loss of life and love as possible. But I can't seem to write or speak a word that isn't misunderstood. If I make an appeal for unity, I'm highlighting our division. If I make an appeal for truth, I'm calling somebody a liar. If I ask us to stay home and safe, I'm labeled a coward. It's tiring. I'm doing my best to remain cheerful and optimistic and to keep on insisting that Jesus is Lord. But if you have a prayer to spare, I could use one. Thanks, Pastor Jim. I mean, there were a lot of us praying for, for Jim last week, and, and he's right. It's been hard to be a pastor. My colleagues and I are struggling week in and week out, but, but the thing is we also recognize that we're not alone. I mean, whatever your vocation, whatever your situation, at some point in the past year, you most likely have or continue to experience the frustration, the challenge, and, and the heartache of this time. Nonetheless, ever since my colleague Jim made this post, I've been holding on to his words, particularly the part, the part where he says, I am hoping we can come through this pandemic and, and through this divisive season in our nation's history with as little loss of life and love as possible. At the same time, it's, it's also had me wondering, how can Isaiah's words help us do just that? Or more so, how can God help us through it? See, while I believe we are a resilient people used to overcoming so much, as, as history can certainly attest, I can't help but wonder if, if we are indeed feeling much like the grasshoppers Isaiah mentions at the beginning of this passage, at a time when we'd much rather be like his eagle. I mean, grasshoppers have wings like eagles, but they can't soar like an eagle. Grasshoppers can jump, but they, they can't soar. Maybe they're interesting creatures, but, but they are far, far from being majestic, which makes Isaiah's claim that people are like grasshoppers seem like this demeaning description of the very people, the people for whom God creates in God's image. And I think it's safe to say we like to think of ourselves and a bit higher up in the created order of things than, than little green creatures, little green critters. However, for the exiles that Isaiah speaks of in, in today's text, they probably felt like they were at the bottom of creation's hierarchy. I mean, captivity in Babylon was, was a painful reality. People were forced from their homes. They were scattered as the temple was destroyed. And they became refugees from the very land that, that was so full of promise. They are a people who longed for Jerusalem and wept by the rivers of Babylon. They are faint and powerless and even observe their youth grow weary and fall exhausted. As a result, each Israelite concludes, my way is hidden from the Lord and my right is disregarded by my God. I mean, they could have concluded that, that the gods of Babylon were stronger than their God. Or they could have concluded that, that maybe that God really didn't exist at all. 
But their conclusion is that they are simply disregarded by the one who sits above the circle of the earth. I mean, all in all, Babylon has just dragged Isaiah's Israel into exile as, as part of God's judgment on her. Israel had been reduced to little more than, than a grasshopper in the created order of, of all things. I wonder if that's how many of us are feeling during this challenging season that we've been through. I mean, all the church, although the church has continued to be the church, whether in person or virtual, it has been different for everyone. For those of us who remain virtual, we miss gathering together physically. We miss it so much. We were created to be in community. I mean, from pastors to members of the congregation, we certainly long for a safe return. And for the churches who are in person, there remains a, an element of anxiety, like what if I get infected or worse yet? What if I unknowingly infect someone else? You know, isolation is, is an issue for many folks as well, from students who miss interacting with classmates in person to, to most of us who are missing meaningful social engagement. Parents are working harder than ever just to accomplish the basics, just you know, juggling things like work from home and serving as teacher's aides at the same time. It's, it's been a challenge. And at some point, we all feel like grasshoppers, but then add to these many challenges, moments of sadness and darkness, and, and we feel even smaller. You see, in the same way, captivity in Babylon was a painful reality. This has been a long season of captivity by way of confinement for so many people. Now, I'm not aware of anyone, at least in our community of faith, being forced from their homes and, and scattered or, or becoming refugees. Many have experienced being displaced from so many things and, and the ways of life that we took for granted less than a year ago. This is not the life that, that any of us expected. And the sense of feeling so small is not, what, not who God created us to be. I mean, yes, compared to the Lord of heaven and earth, we are small. I mean, Isaiah reminds us of this. God is, after all, the creator of everything that is made. I mean, in fact, when we consider anything in, in all of creation, in all of God's creation, the greatest things like spectacular mountain ranges, beautiful oceans, and, and the vast galaxies, they are still small compared to God, our mighty creator. And yes, throughout history, people have have thought of leaders as, as mighty. People still assign extraordinary powers to elected leaders. Yet in this prophetic poem from Isaiah, Isaiah reminds us that God not only raises up such leaders, but also topples them like fragile houses of cards. I mean, there is a word of caution here, a word of caution about falling into the trap of putting too much faith in human leaders and, and putting them above God, Isaiah reminds us that compared to God, even our most talented leaders are like dry dandelion seeds. Even a mild windstorm can scatter. In fact, Isaiah insists even the greatest nations like the Babylon of his day are like a drop in the bucket compared to God. And Isaiah assumes that God's people have always understood that. Yet sometimes, sometimes things happen that from time to time challenge the assumption that, that nothing and no one compared to the Lord. Remember to most of Israel's contemporaries, the Babylon exile was interpreted to mean that Babylon's God was stronger than Israel's God. To them, the destruction of, the Jerusalem, of Jerusalem and Israel was seen as Babylon's God somehow defeating their God. And in many ways, that's what happens when natural disasters occur in our own day and age, when pandemics take lives, when tragedies occur and folks begin to wonder if God really is so great. Sometimes such struggles lead even God's people to wonder if God even cares. Does God care about our illnesses? Does God care about our fear and anxiety? Does God see the evil that sometimes seems to thrive 
throughout the world, throughout our communities, maybe even in our own lives. As one theologian puts it, such thinking suggests that, that we have selective memories and that we remember what we want to remember about God. That's why it's so important for Isaiah to call us back to the beginning of time and a time when God created the earth from nothing, how God named the creation as a series of good days and in the same way created distance, in the same way time created distance between God's creation and the people of Isaiah's time. And they forgot God's goodness in many ways and, and yet God surrounds us in the creativity of life, death, and resurrection. And so in all this, Isaiah is speaking to a weary people, demoralized by circumstance. And so he reminds them nonetheless that they are still under the wing of the one who created the entire universe, who knows and understands everything. And yet we naturally... We want to do our part. We want to do something. We want to do our part to fix whatever's wrong with our world, those that we love and those who love us. But there are things, some things that we can't fix that, that weigh us down. And while we may be able to temporarily renew our strength, only God can give the strength that lasts to those who hope in the Lord. And so we wait. As children of God, we learn to wait for God to work in our lives and, and our world. But, but the thing is, we don't wait around with, with our hands in our pockets, wringing our, or wringing our hands and, and waiting to be jolted to action. Christ followers wait with expectation, standing on our tips toes, so to speak, fully expecting God to revive us and to use us to revive the world, our communities, or maybe just one person. And even in the midst of our own struggles, God finds ways to create the world anew. The prophets remind us, remind everyone from, from children and young adults to seniors that sometimes we grow tired and weary. And even the strongest among us eventually stumble and, and fall. So no matter who we are or what point in life or where we find ourselves, in our faith journey, whether or not we realize it, we all desperately need God's help in Christ. Through Isaiah, we are reminded that those who rely on the Lord find that help. It doesn't mean God will take away our problems, but God gives us strength to deal with them. I wonder maybe if, if you are someone who is tired are you exhausted? Are you grieving? Are you feeling weak? I know I am, and I am daily praying with my colleague Jim that we come through this season with as little loss of life and loss of love as possible. I'm praying daily as well for a renewed spirit for my church because we've been apart from each other way too long. I'm also praying for those I know who are grieving and I'm praying for each of you and for myself and I'm doing it not with my hands in my pockets but while standing on my tiptoes in faith together let us be among those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength as they shall mount up with wings as eagles as they shall run and not be weary and they shall walk and not faint. Thanks be to God. Amen. My faith looks up to thee, thou Lamb of Calvary, Savior divine. Now hear me while I pray,
sign of our faith and as an act of worship, let us offer to God our gifts as we receive our offering. Let us pray. God of grace and mercy, you are the source of the true healing that can make us whole. We are reminded that those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. As we take time now in worship to offer our gifts to you, we pray that they might be used to strengthen others of body, of spirit, of broken relationships, to people who are in desperate need. This we pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. And now we receive this blessing. We are being sent into a world in need of healing. We have been given all that we need to be God's messengers of peace. Go now into the world rejoicing in God's presence with you. And bring the good news of peace and hope to everyone you meet. May all of God's people say, Amen. <laughs>